Chapter 10. The Observer in the Observatory It seemed to Tulip there were fewer servants than the last time she visited, though the castle didn't seem to suffer for it. It looked even more grand than usual, having been decorated for the solstice. Her favorite court companion, Flance, a beautiful black, orange, and white cat, was in attendance to keep her company. Hello, beautiful Flance, she said to her little friend, and she leaned over to pat her on the head. So you've named her? What a strange name. What does it mean? Tulip looked up to see the prince standing over her. Oh, I don't know. I thought you came up with it. I was sure it was you who told me her name. The princess responded. It wasn't me. I don't even like the beast, he said, giving Flance a dirty look as she gave him a, her customary side glance and adjusted her paws. Someone else must have told me then, said the princess. Indeed, that is clear someone else would have had to tell me, tell you. I could puzzle that out on, on my own. And like the featherhead you are apt to be, you've completely forgotten who told you. But clearly someone else told you. Yes, said Tulip in the tiniest voices, trying desperately not to let her lip quiver as he went on. Never mind, I see you've not changed for dinner yet. Well, we can't keep Mrs. Potts waiting. What, what you're wearing will just just have to do. Come, I'll escort you into the dining room, even if you're not fit for the grand affair planned in your honor. Tulip's heart sank and her face turned scarlet. She had, in fact, changed for dinner and made herself up considerably well. At least, she thought so. <sighs> she was wearing one of her finest gowns and had thought, she looked beautiful, she looked quite beautiful. Before she started down the stairway, she made a special effort to look flawless in light of what happened upon her arrival. Now she wanted nothing more than to run away from this place and never come back again. But she was trapped, trapped with this terrible prince. She didn't care how rich he was or how massive his kingdom or influence. She couldn't stand the idea of being married to such a bully. How would she get out of it? She didn't know what to do. She decided to stay quiet on the matter until she could talk to Nanny. After dinner, Tulip asked the prince if he'd like to go on a walk, and he agreed. He was being sullen and quiet, but not cross, so for that, at least, she was thankful. They walked around the lake, which was frozen this time of year, but still breathtakingly beautiful. Could you show me the observatory, sweetheart? The sky is very clear, and I should like to see the view you've spoken of so frequently, if you like. They walked up the long stone spiral staircase until they reached the top floor of the observatory. Even without the telescope, the view was spellbinding. Tulip could see the entire sky through the glass domed ceiling. She felt as if the stars were winking back at her for how joyfully she looked upon them. It seemed they were not the only ones who had decided it was a good night to stargaze. Someone was already looking through the telescope when they reached the top of the stairs. Hello, who's there? The observer didn't answer. I said, who's there? Tulip was frightened, especially after the prince motioned her to get behind him for protection. But as the prince got closer to the intruder, he realized it wasn't a person at all, but a statue. <sighs> What's this? He was nonplussed. Lose it. There had never been a statue up here before, and how on earth had someone gotten it up here without some sort of elaborate app apparatus? There was no way something that heavy could have been brought up the stairs without his knowing. Tulip started to giggle in nervous relief. Oh my, it's just a statue. I feel silly for being so startled. But the prince still had a look of confusion on his face while she prattled on. But it does look kind of creepy, doesn't it? It almost looked like it was giving us a side glance when we walked in. And how odd a pose for a statue, leaning over looking into the telescope. It obstructs our ability to look through it completely. I'm sure there, this wasn't your idea, dear. Honestly, I don't think I like it. I can't tell if it meant to be a man or a woman. Male or female, though, it does look horrified, don't you think? Like something ter terrible came upon it and turned it into stone the prince hardly heard what she was rambling 
His mind was suddenly violated by terrible disembodied voices from the past. Your castle on its ground sh shall also be cursed. Then and everyone within will be forced to share your burden. Nothing but horrors will surround you. From when you lo look into a mirror to when you sit in your beloved rose garden. The prince shuddered at the sound of the witch's voice ringing in his ears. Was he cursed after all? First the drastic change in his appearance, and now this strange event? His servants trapped within stone? He couldn't imagine what it would be like to be trapped like that. He wondered if the person trapped could hear their conversation. If the person was aware he had been entrapped in stone, the thought sent shivers up the prince's spine. Darling, you look peaky. What's the matter? Princess Tulip asked. The prince's heart was racing. His chest felt heavy, and it was hard for him to breathe. He suddenly realized everything the sisters had said was coming true. Tulip, do you love me? I mean, truly love me. When she looked at him, he looked like a lost little boy, and not the spiteful bully he'd been to her as of late. I do, my love. Why do you ask? He grabbed her hand and held it tightly. But would you love me if I were somehow disfigured? What a question. Of course I would. Her heart was again softening to the prince. Not since the night they had met and he had asked her to marry him had he been so kind. You know that I love you, my darling. I love you more than anything, he said desperately as tears welled up in her eyes at his sweet words. I do now, my love, I do now. Princess Tulip was happier than she had dared her hoped on Solstice Eve. She hadn't imagined such a turn of character in the prince. But since that night in the observatory, he had been nothing but sweet to her. Oh, Nanny, I do love him so, she whispered while sipping her spiced wine. How quickly you pivot from one emotion to another, my dear, said Nanny. But Nanny, his disposition has flu fluctuated greatly from one moment to the next. But I do feel he's finally himself again. Nanny did not look convinced. We shall see, my dear. The prince did look grand, glad, Nanny had to admit, and he seemed to be falling all over himself to make Tulip happy. It was almost comical, actually, quite like a mockery of love, but her Tulip was happy, so she didn't press the matter or cast an evil eye in his direction. She did notice, however, Flans, who was perched on Tulip's lap, looking at the prince with hateful eyes. Nanny had to wonder why that cat disliked him so. Perhaps she too saw through his ruse. The prince was very pleased with the solstice eve gathering. He was a bit exhausted by his atten attentions to Tulip, but he had decided there was no better way of breaking the curse than marrying Princess Morningstar. It was clear she loved him a great deal, so he was halfway there. All he had to do now was make the sisters believe he loved her, too. Of course, there were indeed things about her that he loved. He loved her beauty, her coyness, and her keeping her opinions to herself. There was nothing he hated more than a girl with too many opinions of her own. He liked that she showed no interest in books and that she didn't prattle on about her pastimes. In fact, he had no idea how she spent her time when she wasn't in his company. It was as if she didn't exist when he wasn't with him, when she wasn't with him. He imagined her sitting in a little chair in her father's castle, waiting for him to send for her. He loved how she never ga gave him a cross look or scorned him even when he was in the foulest of moods, and how easily she was to manage. Surely that counted for something. Surely that was a form of love, wasn't it? And he figured the sweeter he was to her, the more quickly he would reverse the curse. So that was the aim of this visit, to show the sisters how much he loved Princess Tulip Morningstar. But how would he get their attention? Oh yes, they had to send the prince and his beloved had to seal their love with a kiss. Well, that would be easy enough. He would just have to spirit her away to a romantic setting and bam, a kiss, a kiss she would never forget. He arranged the entire thing with Lumiere, who was best at planning such romantic things. Romantic interludes, he called them. Oh, yes, Prince, 
She will melt into your arms in utter delight when she sees what, what we have in store for her. Mark my words. Wonderful, Lumiere. And Mrs. Potts, she's sort of a hamper for the picnic, has she? Everything is taken care of, even the nanny. We invited her to a tea party downstairs, so she will be very well occupied, and you lovebirds will be able to fly free without worry of your watchful gaze. The prince laughed. Lumiere was always so poetic when he spoke of love, so devoted to the notion of it. The prince couldn't go wrong with having him arrange this little escapade, and he was sure Tulip would be very happy.